But his disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I assure you, whoever does not welcome the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And after taking them in his arms, he laid his hands on them and he blessed them. There are many places in the Bible that tell us as followers of Jesus that we, regardless of our age, are children of God. So as we stand and sing this first song, I want to invite you to put on your little child, your inner little child as you sing. And we're going to sing a song that many of you probably will think, oh, that's just a little child song. But if you research it, you'll find out it was actually written for adults. And I know you know it. And I'm going to invite you not just to sing it with each other, but I'm going to invite you to sing it with all those that have gone before us, who are in the great heavenly choir right now, who are already singing before us. We can join them. Let's stand and let's sing together. Sing it up. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. of 
um, how much he loves us and wants to have a relationship with us. It tells us the story of God's people from when he created us to when he redeemed and forgave us for our sins through his son, Jesus. So today, I'm going to present Isaac with a Bible bag from our church, and inside of it is an NIRV Early Readers Adventure Bible, and Isaac told me he's going to have his mom help him a little bit with this. So we love that, Isaac. That's great. So I'm going to give this to you, and we also have some resources to help Isaac and his family get to know his Bible. And for our first graders who aren't here today, I will deliver those to their homes this week so that they can have them as well. Will you join me in a prayer for Isaac and his family and our other first graders as they get to know their Bibles? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this beautiful day that reminds us of your creation and how much you love us and want to have a relationship with us. Lord, we thank you for Isaac and for our other first graders and their families for their wanting to get to know you and your story better through reading of their Bibles. Lord, we ask that you be with these families as they teach your Bible stories, as they present the Bible to their children, and we ask that you be with our church family that we love and support and uplift them as well. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. And we do have kids' ministry programming going on downstairs right now. I'm going to take Mr. Isaac down there, but if there are any other kids that want to join me, they're welcome to come up and walk down. God reminds us that he wants to have relationship with us. That he not just wants to speak to us, but he wants us to speak to him. It's called love. Love is something that we don't just receive, but we give it. And we can give love in so many different ways. We can give gifts. We can send letters. We can even say nice words. And so that's what I'm going to invite you to do right now. If you want to stand, you can stand. You don't have to. But I'm going to invite you to sing these nice words to God. Because God tells us he wants to hear them. And I know you know these nice words. Christy's going to lead us in it.
couple of things to share as I think about praying this morning for us as a congregation. Um, I want to say a couple of thank yous. Um, I don't I don't think they're here, but I still want to say thank you. Uh, Kevin uh, Knitter, Kevin's on our staff, does our facilities and all that, but Kevin has moved a lot of stuff this week to get us ready for today and getting set up, and I really appreciate that. Jeff as well, uh, having to think through, put all putting all this equipment outside and everything, uh, um, and so I'm grateful for that. And then uh, Patricia has put in a lot of time having to print and proofread and print and proofread and then print again and upload and then harass us for information and all kinds of things to get ready for this week. And I am just really grateful for all that they've done. Um, I'm just grateful for the staff I get to work with and the team that I get to be on. So I, I want to make sure I say a thank you for that. I want to say thank you to you. I was thinking about this driving here this morning as, as I was driving and I got on Broad Street and, uh, and I got to thinking, where are all these people going? And then it occurred to me how many options of things you had to do today. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Some of you right now are thinking about your boat, right? Some of you right now have just gotten a text message from your golf bag saying, where are you? We're ready to go. And other amusements and whatever. But you've chosen to be here, and you've chosen to give this time to God. That is not insignificant that you've done that. It is not insignificant that you've decided to give of your time today to give unto God a small portion, just a small a uh, gift back of all that he has given you and given me. Because this day is a beautiful day, and I promise I won't take us to sundown tonight. You're going to have a lot of day left to enjoy. So thank you for the gift of your time and your investment to be here today. You know, as we come to a, a time of, of prayer, you know, I, I've had a lot of conversations already. Yesterday was a kind of a, a surreal day to consider um, anniversaries of 9-11 20 years ago, uh, continued needs around our world, around our, our country, around our state, and even in our community. This past week, um, Henrico County and, and Hanover went back to school, and uh, uh, I know that uh, Stewart and, and Goochland had our, and Chesterfield had already gone back, so we've got schools ramping up and teachers and kids and all that. Um, things to be thankful for. I had to tell you that Wednesday, one of my favorite moments Wednesday, was looking down the hallway and seeing all these backpacks hanging on the hooks because kids were back. 
in our building. What a gift that was. We had an amazing summer camp. I want to make sure we celebrate that. You may not be aware that probably a hundred or more different kids came through our walls this summer for um, for Quest. What a gift that is. You may not have seen them because they showed up Monday and it was mostly cleaned up by Friday, but you need to know they were in our walls and what a gift it was to have them in our house. And then now starting a a space this past week, our after school program and the gift that that was. And then now uh, this coming week, Agape starts. And we're going to be gifted with all of these children who are going to come into our house and we're going to have an opportunity. We're going to have the the privilege of sharing Jesus with them and how we live, how we speak and how we act. May we never take that for granted, the gift that we have with those students, with those children, with those families. So there's a lot to be thankful for. There are things on your heart and mind this morning as well, I'm sure. And so I'm going to invite us to take a moment to take a breath together. And then I'm going to lead us in prayer uh, together as a church family. So uh, let's pause. Let's take a breath together. Almighty God, thank you for today. Thank you for the gift of this time and for each person here. Lord, thank you for what they've offered with their their offering of worship today, their gifts and tithes that they'll bring for their presence, for their heart, their mind, their soul. Lord, for the opportunity to start a journey today, a journey through your word, uh, the, 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 the record of your revelation to us in Jesus. Thank you for the gift of so many children and families that have walked through our halls this summer and now are coming in this fall. For outside groups that will continue to use our facility, Lord, may we shine as a light for Christ as we have the privilege of having them in our house. And God, for the troubles of this world that can be so consuming sometimes, Bring us back to you, into your arms, into your presence, into faith, into trust in you. Thank you for the privilege we have on this beautiful day to worship you, to give thanks to you. Bless us now in this time, in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. So we are starting. Most of you know, but for those maybe this is your first day or you you haven't gotten that memo and that's okay. We are starting today as a church to go through the entire New Testament together. 27 books of the Bible. We're going to read them all. One chapter a day. One chapter a day. And so you've been given already this morning. You should have gotten a bookmark. If uh, if you didn't, we'll make sure you get one. But you should have a bookmark. And let me say a quick word on these. If you try to use it as a calendar, it will hurt you. <laughs> I get it. We have put on here the chapters that you are reading, and they are matched up with the calendar for that month. Now, if that is just not going to fly for you on our website, you can download a PDF that has the, a, a larger printout version front and back that has the, uh, the dates and the, uh, the chapters as well. And, and if you don't have a printer, tell us and we'll get a copy to you. We're happy to do that. But just to share with you uh, what is on the bookmark so you don't do, get too confused, but you'll see we're going to finish July 4th next year with Revelation 22. Dale Wright. Revelation 22. Um, so anyway, so that's on there. It's on the website. You have the U version. You got links. You'll have videos, all kinds of stuff that we're trying to make available to you in this time. Speed limit one. Let me be clear. Read one chapter a day. Some of you are overachievers, and you're going to want to come to me next week and say, Pastor, I have read Matthew and Mark already. Don't. I'm not saying don't read them. I'm saying don't speed through them. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. 
pace yourself. If you say, well, pastor, I got to read two hours a day, then read Matthew chapter one for two hours a day. You say, I can't read it that many times. Look up the cross references, find a concordance, look up some study help, dig into that chapter so much that you call me on Wednesday and say, hey, I can preach next Sunday. I got it. <laughs> but my point is take your time and let it soak in. Let it marinate. The word of God is not something just to be read. It is something to be internalized. If you have questions, if you read something that doesn't make sense, email me. Get in touch with me. Let me know. I love questions. If I don't have an answer, I'll say, I don't know. I'll try to find out. If I still can't find out, I'll put it out to you all and say, here's the question. Can anybody find an answer? But this is going to be an adventure as a community for us to do this together. We're going to learn together. We're going to study together. We're going to wrestle together. We're going to even disagree at times together. But if you do these readings, understand that if you do these readings every Sunday when you show up for the next 10 months, you will have already read what I'm preaching on. And when I start preaching, you'll say, hey, I read that this week. And you'll understand the context and we'll be able to put that together. So just a word about that as we go uh, through this time, I encourage you to wrestle with the text, dig into it, consume it, eat it up. It is the word of God. It is meant um, to just fill you up and to lead you to Jesus. Towards that end, I want to read for us from Matthew chapter 1 this morning. Matthew chapter 1, I'm going to read this part that most of you usually skip or skim. Most of you read the first verse and you go, hmm, names. And then you go to verse 18 and read the story of the birth of Jesus. <laughs> It's okay. I've done it. All right. But this morning we're going to read the names. Let's talk about Matthew first of all. Matthew was written, scholars think, anywhere between the year 50 to even 100 A.D., most likely somewhere around 70. Um, but there's, it depends on schools of thought and where they kind of land with that. It was written by Matthew, also called Levi. And so when you see the story of Levi being called by Jesus, that's also Matthew. He's called Matthew in one book, Levi in the other. He's the same person. He's a tax collector. And the purpose of this book is to bear witness that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah and the fulfillment of Old Testament Scripture. Matthew wants to link um, uh, millennia to the events of Jesus. He wants folks to understand that for hundreds of years, it's all been building up to this moment with Christ. He wants people to understand that Jesus is the fulfillment, that God has made a promise, and now God is keeping that promise. Themes of this book that you should know are Messiah, kingdom, discipleship, fulfillment, and a universal outlook. As Matthew wants to make it clear that even though the Jews are God's chosen people in Christ, God is now inviting everyone into relationship. That's you, and that's me, that's the person next to you, it's the person in that car right there, it's your neighbor, it's the stranger, it's the person halfway around the world, and it's the person right next door. That God is opening that up to everyone. So with that in mind, I'm going to read Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. I'm going to pronounce these names for you, most of them correctly. But we're going to talk about this. I want to invite you at this time, would you stand in honor of the reading of God's word? And when I finish, I'll say, this is the word of the Lord. You'll respond with thanks be to God. Here now, Matthew 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah whose mother was Tamar, Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Abinadab, Abinadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife, Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, 
Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconai and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconai was the father of Shiltiel, Shiltiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. Abihud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you. So usually skipped, but this is our focus today, as I said. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, I want you to be reminded that no scripture is inconsequential. It is never without purpose. Every word matters when we are studying the Bible. I want you to understand that the very beginnings of this. The word genealogy comes from the word where we get in Greek the word Genesis. So the word Genesis is in the very beginnings of this passage. And it connotates an origin or a birth, but also is used um, in 118 to refer to, um, it refers to the birth there, but also can refer to story. Genealogy is part of a story. We have the word Messiah or anointed one connecting it back to Israel. And then, of course, we see son of David and son of Abraham, where, where the author wants us to understand and connect Jesus all the way back to the promise that God made to Abraham, to the promise God made to David, and is now fulfilling in Jesus. A bunch of names. I know you don't know these people. Maybe you've researched them a little bit. Maybe they're just names to you, but they're important to these folks. They were important to Jesus' family growing up. They knew these names. And they include scandals. If you do some research, you're going to find out some uh, unseemly things happened in the lives of these people. These are not all saints. Well, they are saints, but they weren't all perfect. Maybe I'll put it that way. So we see scandals. It includes women, which was actually very unusual in that time. To give a genealogy and to include the women was actually unusual. But here we find four or five references to women as a part of his heritage. These names are their family. So it got me thinking about my own heritage, my own family. And I, I mentioned last week, a couple of times I've talked the last few weeks about my parents and the impact of my parents on me. So when I speak of David and Teresa Lapeer, you most of you don't know who they are, but it means the world to me and their faith. I could talk to you about um, the Stout family. You don't know the Stout family from Sato, Illinois. Sato, Illinois has a population of about 20. All right. If you blink, you miss it when you drive through. But that's where the Lapeers landed. And uh, part way back through my grandmother's uh, family was the Stout family. And the Stout family helped to found Sato Baptist Church, where my grandparents worshipped, where I've preached. It's a sacred place. I want you to think for a moment about someone in your family that has had a huge impact on your faith. I want you to think of a parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, cousin, sibling, whatever. It could even be a child. I've known of children who've had the impact on their parents. I want you right now to think of one person from your family that has had a profound impact on your faith. And to name your genealogy, you would have to include them as having transformed your life and your faith and inspired you. You got that person in your head? Are you thinking about them? All right, good. I want you to turn to a neighbor and tell them who that person is right now. Go ahead, look at a neighbor and tell them who you're thinking about right now.
You have 10 seconds. I'm giving their life story. All right, let me ask you a question. How many of you just heard a name of someone you've never heard of before? Right? You have no clue that a person that your neighbor just shared a name. You're like, I don't even know who that is. But that person had an impact on your neighbor and has kept them in line with their faith, alive with their faith. And they are here today in worship because of the impact of that person. Think of the importance of that. One of the things I talk about at funerals, often when I do a funeral and it's a, 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 a more uh, uh, experienced person will say they've had a long life and there's typically children and grandchildren and great grandchildren there. And they're there to celebrate their loved one. And I love to look out at the grandchildren especially and say, whatever you love and respect about your grandparent, you can choose to live out as well. When we give examples of people, we talk about a parent, grandparent, and how much we appreciated them or or loved them or were inspired by them. There is nothing stopping you from living like that as well. You can emulate what you respect about them. The other thing I want us to hear from this passage is that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Perez and Hezron and and Salmon and Abinadab and Ruth and Jesse and Rahab, the God of Josiah and Uzziah, Zerubbabel, the God of Joseph and Mary is the same God. And he's the same God of you and of me and of us. Think about that, too, for a second. The God that spoke to Abraham is the same God that speaks today. The God that accomplished his purposes in Jesus coming to earth is the same God working that out with us today. The God that inspired Abinadab and Elihud and all those people is the same God that inspired your grandparents, your parents, your aunt, your uncle, your siblings. It's the same God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing to think about the legacy of a God over all of these generations who is still at work today? And someday, someday, young people, if you're here and and you're under, let's say, 40, we'll make that young people, sorry, I'm in my 40s, so I'm cutting it off. But under 40, you say, you're in. listen, I hope that you live your life and your faith in such a way that in 40 more years, there's another young person sitting out here in the parking lot that speaks your name because you inspired their faith. That's what we're doing. We're living for the kingdom, but we're also living to inspire and pass that on to future generations. So let's talk about the focal point of this chapter, Jesus. If you look at the text, Jesus is in verse 1, he's in verse 16, he's in verse 17, he's even in verse 24. Jesus, the Messiah, is the focus of this chapter. He's the centerpiece because he's the centerpiece of faith. He's the criterion by which all scripture is to be read. In John 5, 39, he looks at the scribes and the Pharisees and he says, everything you read in scripture was written about me. Don't miss that point today. Understand that the criterion, the standard of how we are called to understand God, if we want to read the Bible well, we must know the Jesus of the cross, the grave, and the resurrection. The name Messiah, the name Christ, is a title. It's not just a name. It is meant to be the standard by which everything else happens. And that's a challenge for us today. I want to share with you something I am disappointed in myself over. I am sad. I'm a little frustrated. Pride has gotten in the way. But it is time. I can't give it up any longer. I've been fighting this for years. I've been fighting for years this day. But I realized in the last two weeks I can't fight it any longer. I need to start using reading glasses. (laughs) I have tried. I was here, and then if you've ever heard the phrase playing trombone, I was here and here and here, and I realized that no matter how far away I held it, it was still a little blurry. So I tried out Annie's reading glasses, and I went, wow. (laughs) 
Friends, I'm here to tell you that the same pride can get in the way of us in how we read Scripture. We need new reading glasses, too. I want to invite you as you read the New Testament over the next 10 months to read it in a new way. Because there are going to be a lot of places. You're going to get to a passage and go, oh, I have read this before. I've read this five times. I've read this 10 times. In fact, you'll be tempted to skip it because you'll be like, I already know it. I'm here to tell you that God wants to tell you something new today in that passage. The beauty of Scripture is you can read it a thousand times. And the thousand and first time, you can still get something new out of it. So please don't skip over. Please don't think I already know this. Read it with the mindset of God speak to me in a new way. Why does this matter? Because we cannot, as a church, as a community, and as a world, we cannot discuss and debate the Bible without first reading what's in it. You can't have a conversation. You can't have a, a, a learning, growing discussion with someone over something you haven't read. Or you can't discuss over it because you've read one post about it. Because someone posted that verse, you feel like you know everything there is to know about that verse. There's context. There's a whole paragraph. There's a whole chapter. There's a whole book that you and I need to read to look at the fullness of what is God doing in this text. You might discover that you've been reading it wrong. You might be discover that you've been reading it in an incomplete way, that you read it partly, but God's got something even more to tell you. You might discover that you read it and you don't understand it anymore, and you've got to go ask your neighbor. You've got to go ask another church member. You've got to ask your small group. You've got to ask a, 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 a pastor. You've got to say, help me with this. I've read it, and I don't get it. Okay, well, let's read it together. Let's ask questions together. Let's struggle a little bit together. Let's challenge each other together as we read through this. But read it with the correct lens. These reading glasses I'm talking about, make sure you put on Jesus. Because anything else is idolatry. The temptation is for us to read it by our own standards. Or by the standards of family or friends or the pastor. Listen, if the only thing you learn out of this is what I teach you, you're not doing it right. You're not doing enough. You've got to do that work too. If the only thing else that, that influences you is a TV personality or social media influencers or a teacher or a coach, those are all idolatry. We are called to read this in light of Jesus, not in light of what your coach said. You can listen to what your coach said. You can learn from what your coach said. You can think about what your coach said. But your coach is not Jesus. Your pastor is not Jesus. Your favorite uh, preacher on TV is not Jesus. Your favorite person on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube is not Jesus. Your favorite person on MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, or anything else is not Jesus. So that's the lens we've got to come back to as we read this. I would challenge you this week to think about how much other people influence how you think. And I'm not saying you have to give them up. I'm not, please don't go to your friend tomorrow and say, you have too much influence, we can't talk anymore. Please don't do that. But what I am saying is that you need to check yourself. You need to think about it. You need to think, you know what? There's this one person that I, everything they post on Facebook, I always share it. I always agree with it. Well, hallelujah. But they might be wrong. And so maybe you need to think about that. Maybe you need to consider how to read it for yourself and, and make sure you're seeing it through the lens of Jesus, not through the lens of social media or the world or anything else. Lastly, let me say this. How do we measure success? What do I want to see in July of next year? I have a couple of thoughts on that. Number one is transformation. If you have the same faith in July of next year as you do today, I would suggest you have failed. But I will say that for myself. 
I don't mean that you have less faith or more faith. I mean that you have a growing faith. I mean that it's newer, that it's in process. I mean that you're struggling with the text. You're wrestling with God. You're asking questions because you're growing and searching and then thinking, how do I apply this to my world? I don't want to be the same person in 10 months that I am right now. I want to invite you to challenge yourself to the same. Number two is engagement with new people. If the only people you talk to in the next 10 months are the same people you've been talking to for the last year, you're missing out. You're missing out. There are some really smart people near you right now. Seriously. Some of the people. Now, please don't look at your neighbor and say he's talking about me. I'm the smart one. I'm it. You need to listen to me. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is the people near you, they are really smart. You know why? Because God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can inspire them too. One of the beauties of being Baptist and the idea of soul liberty and, 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 and freedom of conscience is the idea that you and I can read the Bible under the Lordship of Christ, that we can read it and interpret it on our own and find meaning. And I, that may not be exactly what your neighbor finds, but what it does mean, what it does mean is that you are empowered to read and search Scripture on your own and to learn and listen to what God has to say. Don't get caught up in silo, what we call silos or echo chambers. Don't get caught up in just talking to people who agree with you all the time. I know that sounds nice and easy and comfortable, but it doesn't grow you. It doesn't grow you. Third thing I want to share to finish up is the idea of legacy. New generations. Can we be honest for a second? More and more, our young people are walking away from the church. They're leaving. That should bother us. And so you and I need to start doing the work to engage new generations and search Scripture together with them. Not to dismiss them or poo-poo whatever idea they have. Because they see the church right now as hypocritical, divisive, and judgmental, and irrelevant. So instead of reading the Bible and telling them, this is what you have to believe, how do we say, let's read the Bible together and see how God is speaking to us in this. Let's be invitational, not accusational. Let's get back to basics and fundamentals. Let's get back to the gospel. Let's get back to what is in the New Testament. What's in there? What's in your Bible? Not just what do you think about it? What do you post about it? What's in your Bible? Let's figure that out together. Let's explore that together. And I'm here to tell you, as we do that together, it's going to lead us to one thing, and that's Jesus. That I can promise you. If you read it with an open heart, a prayerful mind and under the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit, it's going to lead you to Jesus. You can't read the Bible and not find Jesus. That's what I want us to discover more and more in the days and weeks ahead. I know all these names are people that you don't know a lot about. But God knew them and God worked through them. God knows your name and God's going to work through you. So that someday... When we talk about the legacy of Gaten Baptist Church, your name will be a part of that story. For somebody, for, for little Isaac, who came up here to get a Bible, Isaac's going in first grade. He can't read that thing yet. He can read some of it. And it's okay. But you and I have the privilege of loving children like Isaac, teaching them, working with them, so that someday Isaac, He's a leader in this church. And when someone says, why, do you, why, do you, why are you going there? He's going to talk about you and what you did to raise him up and to bless him. 
The God of all generations is still at work. He's the God of this church, this body. Let's continue that work. Let's read together. Let's challenge each other together. Let's learn together. Let's grow together. Let's be transformed together through the power of God, the Holy Spirit at work through his word. That's my prayer for us today. Let's pray together. Almighty God, thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us and this opportunity to be together as the people of God. Lord, I pray that you would you would help us to dig into the text, to search out what is in the New Testament. We are a New Testament church. What does that mean? And help us to search that out so that, so that we better understand who we are and whose we are and how to share that love with others. So God, thank you for this record of your revelation of Jesus, this love letter that you've given us. Take us deeper into it, transform us, mold us, keep us faithful to you day by day so that we can become the people that you have created and called us to be. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. And amen. Let me give some instructions real quick as we get ready to sing a song. After this song, we're going to have a time of prayer around the church. And in order to make sure we get everybody to be a part of that, I want to invite, if you if you brought a child, if you've got a child down in Kids Men while we sing this song, I want to invite you to, if you would, go ahead and head that way to check them out um, so that you can head on out the doors and be a part of what we're doing. We want everybody to be a part of this. We don't want uh, children missing out on this because they matter. So if you brought a child here for, uh, for Kids Men today, as we sing, if you'll make your way uh, into the church to... Uh, to pick up your child and then be prepared to come outside. You can go right outside the doors there. That'll be where one of the pods is, and you can join them uh, today. But um, as you're able, would you stand at this time as we sing?
I'm so excited for what we're about to do. Let me give you some instructions that I think are going to make sense, but I believe in you to help make this happen for us today. I wanted us to conclude by having a prayer around the church. Let me invite my uh, my pod leaders, prayer pod leaders, if you want to start making your way to your post, uh, you can go ahead and start working that way. And um, you're going to find a, a person up here at this corner, one down here at, at this corner, Two in the middle, outside the ASQ entrance, and then outside the, uh, in between the worship center and the cafe. And then finally at the far corners, uh, back near the, the office, and then uh, at the corner. Here's what I want to ask you to do here in just a moment, is to go towards one of those prayer pods. To go to one of those places. Now, if you are fleet of foot, I'm going to ask you to think about going to the far end. If you are not as fleet of foot, but kind of fleet. Go to the middle. If you just don't feel like being fleet of foot at all, hang here in the corners. That is totally okay. I'm going to let you self-actualize where you think you need to go. But in these times, you can take your chair with you because we will dismiss from that location. But if you want to come back, you can do that as well. Um, as you get to the prayer pod, once everybody's in place, they're going to read a prayer for us. And then we're going to close with the Lord's Prayer together. It's going to be amazing. Trust me on that part. So at this time, if you want to gather your chair or not, there's six places. This corner, the middle, the far corner, this corner, middle, far corner. When we dismiss, please do not run anyone over with your vehicle. There will be people milling around. Let's keep it safe. Thank you. You can head that way.